really excited and I'm really honored actually to have this uh, next group of panelists up here. Um, folks who have been organizing and, and, and doing really great, important work uh, in Ferguson. Um, we know what the events uh, in Ferguson, the killing of Michael Brown, we know what that's, that, that's done for the country as far as sort of um, really just, just waking people up uh, to what's happening. Um, it sparked the movement. Um, Ferguson has sparked the new movement that we're in right now. And we're really excited to have uh, folks here joining us today um, because, you know, we as archivists, as librarians, as, as scholars, um, we tend to sort of study people from afar. Um, and I think we're, again, with this project, we're pushing to say that we need to have people included um, who are doing the work um, um, uh, involved in the conversations about how we remember these events. Um, so I'm really excited that you're here joining us. Um, I'll let um, Dr. Fenderson introduce the panel and uh, take it from here. Great. Appreciate it, Burgess. Um, so I'm not actually going to introduce the panel. I'm going to let panelists, I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And we'll just start on the end with uh, Rashid. Great, great. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you uh, for Doc Now, Professor uh, John. He's the best at everything. Always making sure he includes the social justice in the school. Um, my name's Rasheen Aldrich, uh, 22 years old, born and raised here in St. Louis. If you're from St. Louis, you know the question of what high school you went to. So I went to Parkway West High. I got another Parkway over here to the side of me alum. Um, been active uh, before Ferguson in the Fight for 15 movement, trying to increase a livable wage, um, and recently got involved in Ferguson, served on the Ferguson Commission, uh, and just recently ran in the election in the city for the committee man and came uh, about 55 votes short. So. Yeah, I'm Alexis, um, co-founder of Millennial Activist United. Um, I started, got involved in activism um, when Mike Brown was murdered. Um, Mike Brown saved my life. Um, I'm a college student. I'm married. Uh, I got a kid. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ruben Riggs. I am uh, originally from a small town in Texas called Nacogdoches. There's not a whole lot of reasons why you would have heard of it. Um, but I came up to St. Louis to go to school, um, go to undergrad here at WashU. Uh, before um, August 2014, I was involved in a number of different kind of social justice, um, organizing activism work. Um, I, had, I was connected to an organization called the Organization for Black Struggle, um, where I'd been doing some community organizing um, just that summer um, before uh, the, the uprising started. I, um, after the uprising, I got involved uh, through student activism and community organizing. Um, so the student activism was based on a group called St. Louis Students in Solidarity. It was a collaboration between several different universities in the St. Louis region to um, push student issues or push students to um, address community issues. Uh, and then I also was involved through the Organization for Black Struggle. And after I graduated last May, or I guess not last May, now two Mays ago, which is kind of scary for me on a personal note, um, I uh, got uh, more deeply involved in the Organization for Black Struggle as a member organizer. Um, and after about a year of that, I've since left and I am now. Um, just working on applying to grad school, and I'm a, a research assistant for a social work professor here. Yeah, so good morning. Um, my name is Kayla Reed. I am 26 years old, um, and I'm from St. Louis. I was born here. Um, so I say I was born on the north side, polished in North County. Um, I graduated <laughs> from Riverview Gardens High School, which is the school district that Canfield Green Apartments resides in. And so I lived, uh, my dad still lives uh, less than two miles away from where Mike Brown's body would lay for four and a half hours. Um, so prior to Ferguson, um, I, I used, a long time ago, I went to St. Louis University, didn't graduate. And on August 9th, I was working two jobs. I was a pharmacy technician um, at a compound pharmacy, and I worked at a furniture store. I was at that furniture store on August 9th. Um, and, you know, I think for a lot of people in the world, they can't pinpoint a day where everything changed for them, and I can. 
give you a couple dates. Um, one of those, of course, being August 9th. And so since uh, Mike Brown was killed and the uprising um, and the birth of this new wave of movement that a lot of people are coining, the movement for black lives, um, I did a lot of on the ground organizing, which is where I met Rasheen and Alexis. Um, after the non-indictment happened of Darren Wilson, um, I interviewed for the Organization for Black Struggle, and I was hired on as kind of one of the first generation um, staffers as a field organizer for the city of St. Louis. Um, and I worked there until August 5th of this year, and um, I'm very proud of what we were able to accomplish in that time. And as of recent, I am unemployed. <laughs> but I am about to become a struggling college student right here at Washington University. And my first day of class is next Monday. So I'm really excited for that um, and just very grateful and honored to be here in space with you. So really quick, I think it's important to point out a few things. First, that um, part of the reason why this is a, like, a really extraordinary group of panelists is because they're all local leaders who are fiercely committed to St. Louis. Um, they all are very brilliant in their own right, but then they've also been, they're people who have been offered opportunities to go to various different places, take jobs in other places, do organizing work in other places, but they've always remained committed to, like, to St. Louis. And for me, the local story is really important, particularly when we talk about Ferguson and Black Lives Matter. Um, the other thing is that they're all millennials, right? And so they come to act in activism and, and organizing in very, very different ways. Um, two of them were active prior to August 9th, and two were activated by August 9th, right? And so it's an it's a, it's a interesting panel in that way. But what I want to do, some of them touched on it already. I really want to, to get to ask them about life before Ferguson. So what, were their, what did their lives look like prior to Ferguson? And then move to the question of how that all changed on August 9th. You kind of touched on it already, but... Go ahead. Um, yeah, so again, um, I kind of have, I think I have like a very similar story to a lot of people. I was born in the city of St. Louis and things got bad. So my parents were like, we just need to move to the county. Things would be better if we just crossed that line. So we moved into um, Riverview Garden School District and I went there from fifth grade to high, uh, to graduation. I went to St. Louis University for a year. Um, then I went to the community college, studied human services, had no clue what I wanted to do, which I think is, you know, not unique. But I thought I was like one, like the only person in the world who just didn't know what she wanted to do. Um, and so then, you know, I had took a lot of credits actually to um, obtain my degree in nursing. And I'm so grateful that I didn't finish that. Um, but so I started doing pharmacy work. Um, in like 2009, it's kind of stayed in that because what ended up happening was, you know, the older I got, the more school just felt like it wasn't attainable, not something, it wasn't a priority. I needed to pay bills. I needed to help my family. Um, my dad is actually right now in the hospital. He is in surgery. He went in at seven, so he should almost be done. Um, and he was, he got diagnosed with kidney failure when I was 16. And so, for me, it was just being stable, being the stable one was kind of what I, what my family knows me to be. Um, and so I got a second job, you know, at 20, I kind of always had one from like 22 until Ferguson, um, just because that extra money could help my family, which I think is really unique to a lot of the people who came out into Ferguson. We were working class, poor, um, a lot of fast food workers. I remember a lot, like the first time I met Rasheen was like right in front of the tanks and he was like leading chants. Um, and so, you know, it was just kind of like, let's survive. I was in survival mode before August 9th. Um, and I remember that day very specifically because I was exhausted at this furniture store. Uh, we have a furniture store called Weekends Only because it's only open on the weekends. <laughs> um, so I was there on a Saturday, and this girl who was my replacement was late, and I was furious because I was ready to go. And when she got there, you know, she, you know, I'm like, I don't want to hear these excuses. She's like, no, seriously, a boy just got shot in my apartment complex and he's still on the grounds. I was like, what? You know, like, that doesn't even sound like the county. You know, like, we hear about, mm -hmm. I think we heard about police shootings, you know? Like, I remember vaguely hearing something about Kerry Ball um, in 2013 and other situations, but, like, not in the county. You know, like, that felt like what was happening in the city. And so by the time I got off um, and went into Ferguson, you know, 
I was just so shocked. And so for the next three months, I would keep going to work 9.30 to 6, getting off at 6, going home, eating, changing, going to Ferguson by 7, staying in Ferguson until it depended on the conversation in the night. Some nights it's like 2, 3 or more, two, like 2 or 3 o'clock a.m. and then go home and get up and go to work the next day. And that was like this cycle that I was creating um, of being a pharmacy technician and trying to do something to help my community and not really knowing if that's giving away bottled water, if that's giving people rides, if that's organizing the meeting. Um, but a lot of us were trying to just sustain. You know, we still had rent payments on the first that were due by the fifth. Um, after the fifth, you owe 10% of your rent payment on, in addition to your rent. And that was looming while also trying to figure out how to help um, not knowing that we were in the mo like this movement moment, but also just really literally trying to honor Mike Brown and figure out what we could do to make sure that he wouldn't be one of the many ones who would not get justice. Um, yeah. Great. Um, so uh, as I as said before, I was a student um, before the uprising began, and I was uh, majoring in anthropology and African American studies. So I was already kind of very people-oriented, kind of social justice was like what I was trying to major in. We just didn't have anything called that. Um, and uh, so a lot of my like daily life kind of reflected that kind of that orientation. I was a part of uh, student groups like the um, Association of Black Students, um, some, other, some others kind of smaller things, but um, the kind of main ways that I engaged um, were through the Organization for Black Struggle, um, which I'll talk more about in just a second, and um, as, as a program here at WashU called the Civic Scholars Program, um, which was all about um, civic engagement um, and community uh, engagement. So uh, early on, um, I, when I came to St. Louis, I had like grown up in this really small, um, very segregated, um, very evangelical, conservative, like small town, um, and so like I had like never, certainly never heard someone talk about like racial justice or social justice. Like I didn't even know the term social justice. Like that was like just how far removed I was from like um, a lot of the like issues that were happening here in St. Louis. Like it just was not on my radar. Um, and then when I came here in 2011, um, immediately I was like kind of like thrown into like the issues that St. Louis is facing. Um, and like met amazing professors like Dr. Fenderson, um, um, Professor Dr. Mustakim, um, and Bob Hansman uh, here at the university, who I think a lot of like the student activists um, at WashU have like would attribute to kind of like their awakening, and um, then kind of became more aware of the, of issues and kind of re, re understood my own like personal life growing up in the small town. Um, and then I um, soon got connected to the Organization for Black Struggle, which is this local community group, um, which had been around for 30 something years um, and had taken on a lot of different forms, kind of started as this like um, black commune kind of um, group of people that were just living together, teaching their kids and has taken on several, several different forms from then. Um, but when I got connected to it, it was just this really small kind of ragtag group of people um, and we like had aspirations for what we wanted to do and um, had a lot of really good language, but um, certainly weren't at the point of like being very effective. Um, but it was far different from the kind of privileged um, experience I was having at WashU. So um, it was, for me, a very um, intensive kind of growth situation. And then um, through a combination of like grants and um, programs I was doing at WashU and um, the experience I was having with like community people that were like actually trying to do things, um, I ended up um, starting a, a community organizing project um, with uh, Jonathan called uh, Renew 22. And it was all about um, building political power in the 22nd Ward in St. Louis. Um, so um, the summer of 2014, that just every day, went out knocking doors, um, talking to people, identifying issues, um, trying to um, bring people together. Um, we had like a block party with over 100 people um, come together and like actually talk about community issues. And then um, we had this like really big community meeting planned um, for one day where we were gonna like pick an issue, um, like reveal all the survey data and like, you know, get people moving. And that day was August 9th, um, 2014. 
Um, so I spent my entire summer working on like these, te like the kind of economic and uh, racial injustice issues that are at the like heart of the Ferguson movement. And um, yeah, and then it kind of all culminated in a, in a way Ho wasn't quite expecting. Um, so I don't know if you want me to talk about what happened, what's different after, but that's we'll kind of like We'll a, get to that in yeah. just a sec. Let's jump to you, Alexis. So just before the movement. Just right before the movement. So um, before the movement, I'm um, in 2013. Um, I was in a car accident. I lost my dad. I lost my ex-partner, and I lost my uncle. Um, and I was the only one who made it. Um, so I was pretty fucked up. I hope we can curse on this. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was pretty fucked up. Um, and excuse me to the elders in the room. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was super depressed. Um, and then I was in Phoenix, Arizona, visiting my dad's brother um, when, when Mike Brown was killed. Um, my childhood friend uh, actually saw it outside his window. And so he was the person who posted the in infamous picture of Darren Wilson standing over Mike Brown. Um, that's like everywhere. Um, so that's the first thing I saw when I woke up in Phoenix, Arizona and looked at my timeline. And the first thing I thought was, damn, that's messed up. Another nigga got shot in St. Louis. And I actually put my phone down and got up and went to brush my teeth. And then when I came back to my phone, so many people had gone down there to see what was going on because I guess the energy, the energy was different. People would, just, people would say that the energy was different that day. Um, and so, yeah, I was just in Arizona um, chilling. And I came back home um, after Mike Brown was killed because I couldn't stay. I wanted to come back home. And before the night before I went out on the ground, um, I was going to kill myself. And I put a gun to my head. Um, and I stopped myself because I said I couldn't kill myself without seeing what was going on outside. And I went outside, and I never came back in the house. Um, and here I am. So that's what I mean when I say Mike Brown saved my life. And so really, um, I say I like to say my life wasn't nothing <laughs> but me being depressed and like going through depression um, before Ferguson. And it's transformed me. So. Um, I always tell people I came out the room, the wound active. I wasn't sure how I was, but uh, I came out active. Uh, so my right leg, I got a prosthetic. Uh, my right leg wasn't getting proper blood flow when I was inside my mom, so it grew shorter than the left leg, so it stops about between my knee and chin. So I was coming out, uh, you know, butt first, telling the world, kiss my, you know. Uh, but I say active because I hop around pretty much all day. When I take my leg off, I hop. I don't sit down. I'm trying to always move, and you can't sit me down. So before August 9th, um, like I said, I grew up in North St. Louis in zip code 62106. Uh, I still live there. It's made up of like Murphy Park, Car Square, um, St. Louis Place, Old North. Um, I went to Parkway. Um, when I was going to Parkway, um, probably around middle school, I, my mom was very uh, plugged in into the community. She used to work with the previous alderwoman, April Ford Griffin. Um, and we all want to be like our parents, right? So I would see her do these Thanksgiving drives and these Christmas giveaways and like neighborhood cleanup. So I would also want to go with her because she was, you know, my shero. Um, and just seeing my mom being really plugged into the community, I guess, gave me this idea of I want to be like my mom. I also want to do something for my neighborhood. Uh, going to Parkway and living in the city, it was interesting because uh, like I had the best of both worlds, right? I was able to go to West County where the grass was greener, the air was nice. I mean, you can walk to the gas station um, with your friends and just buy a bag of chips, and it just seemed like the best of time. But I would go back to my own neighborhood and feel like an animal, right? I feel encaged in my own community. There was no opportunity. There was no parks. When I would walk to the one park in Car Square uh, Village, when me and my friends would walk to, sometimes we would get harassed, right? We would get messed with by police. I was a little younger. The older boys, and being a little skinnier, I guess I don't look like a threat, right? So the older boys would get um, harassed, asked to pull out their IDs and sit on the curb and stuff like that, and then we would proceed on to the neighborhood. During high school, I did kind of, I said I wanted to go to college, but, you know, I'm sure what looms over everyone's head that makes them scared of student debt that my mom and my brother had. So even though I said I wanted to do the politics thing in college, I went half a day into like a trade school and took Keaton and Coolin and got certified in that. But after high school, 
I realized that, once again, being a little skinny guy and a prosthetic, I probably wasn't fit to be lifting air conditioners all day. And I really wanted to do for the people and really for my neighborhood. So I went to um, Forest Park for about a year. And then during that year, my mom was running for alder person down in the neighborhood. Um, and when she was running, it was someone else running in a race in her area. Uh, but I ended up meeting a guy named Justin Stein, who used to work for Missouri Jobs of Justice. And he basically took me under his, his wing. He basically opened up my eyes to the issues that are going on. And this little square in my block is going on in Ward 3 and is going on in Ward 7. He really gave me, I guess, the opportunity to get involved in a way that I didn't know how to. Um, so I ended up getting plugged in with Missouri Jobs of Justice. At the time, I was working at McDonald's. This is senior year. Um, well, I started working at McDonald's in 10th grade out there in the county, so I would come home and drive all the way out there. Uh, like Kayla said, it was just working to help my mom keep detergent in the house, tissue, you know, sometimes the lights would go out, being a single um, mother, just trying, to, just trying to do the things that help her to, you know, take some stress off her back. Um, so about 12th grade year, I was still in high school. I mean, 12th grade, of course, I was in high school. I graduated. I was still at McDonald's. I transferred from McDonald's to Jimmy John's uh, down in Soulard, ding dong Jimmy John's freaky fast. Um, <laughs> and at the time, Missouri Jobs of Justice was doing a campaign called Increase the Wage and Cap the Rate. Increase the minimum wage and cap the rate on payday lending, basically trying to phase them out because they're in a lot of African American communities. Um, folks need a little bit of extra cash, but at the end of the day, these payday loans are ripping folks off where they can't pay them back, putting them in debt. Um, so I started doing some speaking from like a low-wage worker standpoint, what it meant to be uh, a low-wage worker and still trying to go to school, only getting 20 hours, but only making 765. Um, trying to move out on that wage, it, it just wasn't happening. So did some stuff with them. Um, later on, that campaign failed because of the system is guilty as hell, and they managed to, uh, all the signatures we collected managed to like come up missing or something like that. Um, and so I stayed, continued just working at Jimmy John, trying to support myself. Afterwards, maybe a year later, uh, this white guy, one white guy with tattoos all over him, kind of looked a little sketchy, like a, a rocker type, came inside Jimmy John, was asking me all these weird questions like, hey, you like your job? No. <laughs> How much you get paid? Nothing. Um, if you could get paid more, you know, fifteen dollars, would you? Wouldn't you like that? Yeah, but that ain't that ain't happening in Missouri. I mean, this is this is pretty much the South. As as much as people don't like to look at it, it is the South. Um, but he ended up organizing me, and he talked to me off the job, and he was saying, "Hey, there's this bigger movement going on where workers are standing up, trying to get you know a higher wage in a union." Fast forward, after I thought he was crazy and all the other organizers was crazy as hell and it wasn't going to happen here in St. Louis, came May 8th, my store, Jimmy John's, was the first store to go out on strike with four other workers. And then the next day, Griff Pancake, who had made me hold a sign and another coworker hold a sign for making the wrong sandwich and being like 15 seconds over drive through and taking a picture of it, was fired um, that next day. So I just continued to you know plug in with the Fight for 15. We made great strides. And at the time I was working, August 9th happened, I was working at National Alamo out at the airport, cleaning rental cars as a service agent. And uh, I remember seeing like a lot of, so the, the job is right off of 70 Interstate. So I remember first before I seen all the police cars flying down the highway, like Alexis, I remember going on Facebook when I was in a car and I was looking at it and I seen on Fox News that uh, a young man was killed at the hands of police, and I was like, you know, that that's sad, but it's nothing that I haven't heard or I haven't seen in my neighborhood, and nothing really happens, right? I didn't see this story. I know it's going to happen. The rhetoric is going to come out. He's a criminal. He was this. He was that. Nothing's going to come of it. Uh, and then I seen another one, maybe from like Channel 5, reporting the same thing, killing in Canfield. I seen another one on Facebook, and I was like, all right. And then I had seen, I think I had got on Twitter. And then I think when I got on Twitter was when it was a little bit different. The stories, uh, you, you see more of a live feed, right? Uh, so you kind of was able to not just hear what a reporter was saying to make it sexy or, you know, trying to appeal to the masses or whatever. But you, you heard from a real encounter of someone who was on the ground, and you seen the images, and then you seen the video. Um, 
And I instantly had called my sister, Janina Jenkins, who is also part of the fast food movement, who worked at the McDonald's on West Florissant, um, and asked her, did she hear what was going on? There was someone killed out there, you know, what's going on? She was at work, she didn't know, she just heard gunshots. Um, later during the day, I end up seeing, like I say, a lot of just police cars flying down 70, flying constantly, not one, but multiple police cars. So, and then I went home, uh, I ended up calling Janine, I was like, you know, we gotta go check it out just to see what's going on, right? Um, so we ended up going out, I think day two, uh, just to check it out. And then from that, we tried to contact, we did, we contacted Charmel, who was also part of the fast food movement, and tried to use the skills that we learned in the Fight for 15 to take out the Ferguson, but um, even though what we was doing in the Fight for 15 wasn't technically traditional organizing, um, those skills that we learned in that movement wasn't necessarily best applied out there in Ferguson. It was a different situation. It was um, a different, it was a different situation. So you all have brought us up right to this moment of, of August 9th when Michael Brown is killed and what you all were doing in your lives. But now I want to kind of pivot a little bit and ask you all how social media kind of impacted or, or influenced the way you actually uh, engaged out in the streets. And of course, this changed over time. Um, from the earlier days, you, you both have mentioned seeing uh, you know, the story on Facebook. But then as things uh, kind of unfolded, Twitter became um, kind of the central social media uh, you know, uh, site that everyone engaged with. And I want to start with you, Alexis, particularly because early on, I mean, your handle at the time was Music Over People, and early on, I think you were one of the, uh, the most clearest and um, obviously passionate, but um, central voices in the, in the conversation that unfolded on Twitter. So how did social media impact what you all were doing out there very early on? Um, so, yeah, so again, I was depressed, <laughs> like, <laughs> all, uh, right before the movement started. So Twitter was like a safe haven for me, so I would always be on there. So. Uh, my partner calls me a Twitter nigga uh, because that's how much I'm on Twitter. So, yeah, I am just always on there. I had of a platform a little bit, and then I went out on the ground and I started tweet because I live well. I lived in Ferguson, context. And my grandma lives there, um, and I lived with her at the time that it happened. So I just kind of just walked down the street, um, drove down the street, and yeah, um, yeah. So then I would just tweet about it and people would retweet it and people would be, um, and a lot of it was people just intrigued by the riot porn, um, us getting tear gassed, um, you just got arrested and you're tweeting from the van, that's so cool, you know, like, oh my God, you're standing in front of the police, like, you know, people just wanted to see that. But um, I would also do a lot of processing because um, Twitter was my open book before the movement, um, before Ferguson, and it became my open book during during, so I got to express like how things were making me feel, and I think that gave people a different look into things too. Um, and then my partner tweets the same way as well, so it gave that personal look at Ferguson, which is why I think our platform ended up the way that it did. Um, yeah, and so then it turned into me coming out. Um, I shaved all my hair off. I had a whole bunch of hair before the movement, and it's gone. And I came out, and I got married um, to a woman, and. <laughs> yeah, it's lit. It's lit. Uh, she's great. She's great. Um, so yeah, I got married, and then that that kind of like because that story took off, uh, me and Brittany kind of became this face of like queer activism, and we didn't want to be, um, but it just it just kind of happened. Um, but then I learned that that's what I wanted to embrace. Um, I went to a talk at Cornell University. And because I talked so much about coming out and how they interacted with the struggle, like with the movement, because they were both so combined, because I came out in the movement, so I got to experience the homophobia, I got to experience the sexism, um, and all the internal stuff we see in movements, and so I, would, I just would talk about it. And I went to Cornell University to do a um, keynote, and somebody came up to me, they were a black queer person, they them pronouns, and they told me that they liked that they appreciated seeing me on the front lines, me and Brittany on the front lines, because that let them know that somebody was fighting for them too. And that let me know that like my work, my part in this movement is to be the black queer voice and speak up for the black queer and the black trans people that we often leave out of the conversation. Um, and so, 
yeah. And then that now that's become our platform, um, and that's what Mao is, and that's what Mao does. So yeah. And I'm gonna uh, ask Kayla and then ask Rasheen and Ruben the same question. But I'm asking them, you two in particular, because you all were not activists prior to August 9th. So how does the social media um, play a role yes. in your early work? Yeah, so on August 9th, DeRay, uh, how many people, everybody know DeRay, right? <laughs> um, DeRay made a Twitter moment about Ferguson. And I don't even know how they really use the advanced search option on like Twitter yet. I mean, I'm sure it exists, but I don't. So he found a tweet that I tweeted on August 9th. And I'm just like, y'all, I just got home from Ferguson, and I just can't believe what I saw. I think on that day, I had like 252 followers. Like, everybody that followed me, I knew. Um, probably went to high school or college with. And so I wasn't on Twitter. Um, had, had the same handle, just wasn't really like a Twitter person. And so I remember kind of those first 10 days, I, like I couldn't do the lot. When I just had a really bad cell phone. Like I had a, a <laughs> Samsung. And my, like the battery would die and the plug was broke, so I used to have to like take the one battery out, put another battery in. It was a struggle, like super struggle. Like, struggle. And so what I would do, like any videos and pictures I would take after I would get home at night, I would make this really long Facebook post, like here's what happened. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember, you know, my phone would die in Ferguson, and uh, my dad would like comment on my Facebook wall because I wasn't answering my phone anymore, and he'd just be like, check in, let me know where you are. And so once I realized that, like, you know, Alexis, like, everybody else was using Twitter, I was like, oh, Twitter, okay. <laughs> Hashtags, you know, like, I was just type a regular person, like, okay, let me figure this out. And so um, I still would, you know, kind of, like, we would be in a moment, and then I would go to, like, not in the moment. So I learned this skill, and it's like a skill that you learn and lose, because now I've lost it, of live tweeting, where you're just like, <laughs> you're like, you're like running, and you're like, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. Um, help, help, like, they got us. Uh, Lexus is in jail, hashtag Ferguson. Um, and so just like, but what, I, what it started to do was this underlying thing of like, we just knew where each other were. Like, even if we didn't talk, you know, like, now Alexis is, like, one of my, like, closest friends. But, like, be, back then, I'd be like, okay, I'm off work. Let me see where Alexis is. <laughs> like, let me see where, you know, Tess is. Let me see where, like, whoever I knew at the time. Um, and, I, like, I just, so we started to do the storytelling thing. And I remember um, what people were saying back to us was, hey, this is not what mainstream media is like recording at all, like nobody, this, these videos look re like really different, the perspective of where the camera's at is different. Um, you know, there's this infamous picture of like Don Lemon trying to talk about Ferguson and everybody's just like, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, like what you about to say, don't, don't make, make me, Don me Don smack me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so it was this real like tension between mainstream media where like, like one night uh, KMOV got kicked off the lot because they reported a really bad story the night before, so they came back the next day with the mic, and everybody was like, not here, like, not tonight. And they were like, you can't. We have the First Amendment. And we're like, First Amendment, we just got tear gas, bro. Like, your First Amendment doesn't matter right now if we don't, like, our lives don't matter. I remember CNN got kicked off a couple nights, um, and a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people don't tell the story that none of these mainstream people, none of these, this media came into the city until the Quick Trip burned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't, they stay for a while. And then they wouldn't come back again until the non-indictment. Um, then they wouldn't come back again until two cops got shot. Mm -hmm. And so it was always this like sensationalized event, but it's not telling the actual story that people had been in Ferguson so much that they had lost their jobs. Um, people who lived in Canfield had been fired because they couldn't make it to the bus line, the 74 on West Florissant, because West Florissant was shut down because it was tanks on that street every single day that we would get tear gas for one person standing in the street, you know, like traffic was not stopped. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't even be stopped if there weren't tanks right there. And so we were able to like articulate this story in a way that was like really putting the blame of the uprising on the police, that they were the agitators, you know? And so um, I remember just like being able to tell those stories that this, like, this is what's happening outside of the story. And like, we could, we would even go after some reporter sometimes. It's like, no, you just, like, what you just wrote is wrong. Mm -hmm. The headline is trash. The sentence is trash. Like, redo it. And they're just like, I'm sorry, I apologize. 
And so you, then, you, then you start to see, like, you know, some of the reporters have more access, like Wesley Laurie um, got a Pulitzer. Mm -hmm. He got a Pulitzer because he didn't, he was like, what do you want me to say? Because I don't want to mess up. <laughs> like, <laughs> like did, I, did I get this right? Like, he's always in someone's DMs, like, what's the proper pronoun? I'm just trying to be right. Um, and so it, it really became this storytelling thing. And then what, what ended up happening was, um, as the live tweeting skill started to grow, we were able to really articulate from start to finish what was happening. And when I remember we got introduced to this like mind blowing thing called a battery pack. And it was like my phone is always charged. Like where has this thing been? Yeah, it was, so it was so God sending. And people were just like send, like they weren't like sending you food. No, they were sending, sending you boxes battery. of yeah. battery packs. Like yeah. stay alive, stay charged, stay woke. It's like, um, we'll stay woke. Yeah, they, like, you can just walk like, up and down the street yeah, and get like, a battery, battery pack. pack? You're like, who are <laughs> yes, you? They're I like, do you need a battery pack? Pro that's probably when our phone got tapped. Like, just plug it, <laughs> yes. just random thing into our phone. Um, the cops are like, we got them. <laughs> um, <laughs> so real. But yeah, so like, I just had like seven battery packs. And so at night, like, on my floor, just be lit up of all these different things. Um, I remember my job gave me a battery pack. They were like, you might need this now. Ha ha, these racist white people. Um, <laughs> So yeah, it, was, it just became this way to like tell stories and be in community with each other. One of the most powerful moments that I love to bring up um, was when the tear gas happened. This um, this this girl in Palestine sent us tweets on how to handle tear gas. She was like, "Hey, that looks a lot like what they use over here," and you know, like if we can if we can just be honest, I'm a city kid, you know. Like I would say, I'm a city. I'm a city nigga. Like, I don't know nothing about Israel and Palestine in 2014. And so I'm like, I don't know. Like, what's, where's Palestine? What is going on over there? Whatever. So, <laughs> that was so like, that was just real life. And I think people need to, like, people do this thing where it's like, oh, you don't know about the Israel and Palestine conflict, you know? And it's like, <laughs> no, because I'm trying to pay my rent. <laughs> I'll have cable. Like, and so I think, you know, we have to do this thing where, like, people intersect in this really real way. So this girl is like, cut a two liter bottle in half and pull a couple holes in it and put a wet towel in the bottom. And it filters the clean air through the space mask. And I'm like, okay, um, thanks. And so everybody, like she's tweeting everybody she can get a hold of the same story. And just recently my um, roommate went to Palestine and met her. Hmm. And I like almost cried over the phone because I was like, can you just hug her? Because once I realized the Palestine and Israel conflict, like, <laughs> once I realized what that was, I was like, holy crap, you found time to tweet us in, like, in America? And then that would later connect to this woman who came from Palestine to this event and said, I know Palestinians won't be free until the black American is free, that our struggles are so interconnected and you are in the belly of the beast. And freedom, this idea of liberation, was so new to me. I was like, wait, we're not free? And Ferguson smacked me right in the face and was like, nah, you never were free. And you need to really fight for this new idea of what freedom is. And so Twitter allowed us to be both vulnerable um, and real. You know, like that I was a, I was a real person that had to work. Like, y'all, I can't come online until 6 o'clock. My boss is like, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to like encrypt Twitter on my de like desktop and like swipe <laughs> around and do all this stuff. And so it, it allowed us, it showed us up. And then what it also did was feed this narrative that the movement was leader fool. Um, I remember the first time I said that, I was like, I, like we, this, this dude was like, you guys are leaderless, right? You're leaderless. And I'm like, no, I think we're pretty much leader fool because everywhere I look, I see someone who has a skill that I don't have that's so necessary for this movement. I see someone who does work in a different way that I do that's so necessary for this movement. And what it, what it combated was this idea that they could just not kick down one door and shoot one person and the movement was done. That it was so many of us, and we all had such different experiences that they just couldn't. You know, I remember um, Rasamano, who's like the riot king in St. Louis, was like, your face is on the board. And I was like, well, how many faces is on the board? He was like, a lot. <laughs> I was like, well, then cool. Like, I'm pretty sure I'm not high up on the list. I don't, like, now I don't know exactly where I am, but back then I wasn't so high on the list. Um, but it just allowed us to really it, uh, democratize the movement in a real way, where people got to opt into the people they connected to. So I remember Ferguson, October, I was like sitting on the curb, very unhappy with what was happening in St. Louis at the time. Because it was like all these people came to St. Louis for Ferguson, October, and were like, woo, Ferguson, yeah. And it's like, we just got tear gas, bro. Like, what are you talking about? Like, sit down, somebody just died. And this girl walked past me, and she stopped, and she looked at me, and I was like, I don't know who this person is. And she came back, and she was like, I just want to hug you. I follow you on Twitter. And like, 
like your voice resonates with me. And like those moments are so powerful because mm -hmm. in a world where both like being both black and woman, you are often minimized any race. You know, you're invisible <laughs> in a real way. Um, and when you don't conform to all of these standards that the world says is what is unique enough to be lifted up, you know? Um, so someone saw us, they, like they connected to Alexis' story, you know, they, like they saw just like a working class person in me and was like, yo, I appreciate the fact that you try to do something every day because then what it made is the, it made the movement accessible. It wasn't this idea that you had to have a PhD, that you had to already have thousands of Twitter followers, that you had to be working in this social justice organization already. It was anybody who wanted to fight. If my, like if Mike Brown literally means fight back to you, then like this is this is your home. This can be your home. This, like, we will be your family, and we will protect you and fight for you in a way that like none of us ever recognized that we did. And so social media was just this really big room, and it became kind of family. Where like even now I'm like my dad's in the hospital, and people I remember tweeting like two years ago, or like I'm praying for you. I hope he's okay. I know he was just there. Not like they connect in a real way. And um, I think it humanized us when we were constantly, constantly villainized, mm -hmm. you know, where we were called rioters and looters. Um, and we were anti-police and, you know, like I am anti-police now. <laughs> like, but back then I just didn't have that analysis. I was just hurt and sad that this young boy had to be killed and lay in the street. I just wanted to do something. So I think social media definitely allow people to see our humanity, which is the basis, which is the demand of this movement, right? Is that you recognize black people's humanity to the point where you opt to not kill them and you allow them to live, you allow us to live um, to our full selves. And so, yeah. And so I also want to pose this question to Ruben and Rasheen because you all were coming from a kind of old school organizing background that wasn't driven by social media. And so how did social media change the way you all kind of engaged? I'll start with Sheen and come back to Ruben. So I wasn't like like Kayla. I had a Twitter, but I was all into Facebook. I, I just couldn't everything or retweet. I just couldn't get with Twitter. So I was like, I guess I'm young, so I gotta have it. So I'ma have it, right? <laughs> you, all those programs, you at least check them out, or social media sites, you check them out. You'd be like, either I'ma keep it, or I'm not. So Twitter was one of those things that I used to just check in a little bit, maybe tweet. At the time, it was my wifey Nikki, um, but she would never tweet back. Uh, <laughs> the, the the fight, but the the, the fight for fifteen actually they actually use uh, social media a lot. I think actually social media was the way that really blew up our campaign because we use a lot of personal stories and put those personal stories uh, on social media. Put the picture with the background. Put how this you know young. 32-year-old woman who's working at McDonald's and working somewhere else, um, still have kids trying to keep her lights on. Put the story with the images really like made uh, a big impact. Um, and we started doing those a lot. From that, we actually started calling them like pictures and quotes. Uh, so we would take pictures of workers and then put a quote with it because folks wouldn't really put a story with when you're going into Jimmy John's, what that person really going through, or when you're going to you know, Taco Bell, that that's a mother of two that has a college degree, right? But note, we just went in a recession, so all our factory jobs are gone. But Jimmy John's and McDonald's build and was able to stay. Uh, so social media was, it was something we actually used. But going back a little bit to like what Alexis and, I know I got to go off script a little bit, Alexis and Kayla was saying, um, I think Twitter became, not necessarily for me, I didn't use Twitter that much. I was like the loud mouth in the streets. Uh, trying to keep people like organized and just trying to keep chants going and try to keep uh, the energy going, but Twitter ended up becoming you know our our space. It wasn't originally that it didn't start off as that, but uh, we took it over and we, we we made it ours. We made it our space. We made it to something where, like Kayla said, where we could check in with other folks. We know where uh, other activists were. If you wasn't able to come out to Ferguson that day, you just hashtag Ferguson, right? and see what was going on, or if you was at work to see what type of support uh, that they needed. Um, it, became, it became a space where we was able to tell the truth of what was going on. We was able to tell what the national media wasn't telling. Like Kayla said, when they just wanted to say we was rioters and looters, and you know we was going inside the stores, and actually it was a lot of us up here and a lot of other activists that was trying to stop individuals from going inside the stores why the National Guard literally stood in the middle of the street and seen it all happen. 
Um, so we was able to change the narrative, uh, maybe not on a national level at the beginning, but uh, we end up being able to change that narrative and let people really know what was going on on the ground. It's not what you know they're making it to be. It's not you know folks are just coming out here to cause trouble. And the 100, how many days was we out there? Like 190 something. Out of those days, it was like what one or two or three times that uh, people tried to take advantage of the movement. Um, so we were just really able to own that space and take what was ours, really, our story, our message, and uh, spread it across the world, but also to use that space to be connected with one another, to use that space to uh, know where Alexis is, know where D-Ray is, know where Ruben is. Uh, some folks was on uh, South Florence and why there was actions going on over there, and some folks was on West Florence, and so even when we was disconnected, we were still connected. Oh, they need more folks over there by the police station. So folks would go over there. Uh, it was just really, it was our go-to space to make sure that we kept what the movement, at the time we didn't know it was a movement, but uh, kept the movement going and truthful and honest and not let it get hijacked by the national media just to tell a sexy story. Yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> I have a, a lot of mixed feelings about social media uh, when it comes to Ferguson. Um, I'm definitely like already an old curmudgeon <laughs> and uh, have never like, you know, fully embraced the whole social media um, platform. Um, and I, for me, like social media was both like, you know, an aid and like a burden um, for like what I was doing in the movement. Um, I think. What I what I kind of came to realize was that like it was incredible at like mobilizing people, um, helping us mobilize people, um, and like it like activated people seeing the images and the live stream and watching that like you know I'd spent my whole summer organizing before um, like Ferguson popped off and then like um, August 9th happened and I was supposed to leave um, at like 3 in the morning to go back home to Texas for a week. Um, so like the live streams were really important for me like that that first week when I like couldn't be here even though this was something I like cared about like I had that first night and then I was like <laughs> disconnected, you know um, So like it absolutely pl played a role in keeping people connected, but I think it also There was so much that happened in between those those moments of like, you know the first few weeks when everyone was just like nightly and then the Ferguson October and the non-indictment and everything else there was so much that happened in between that like I think social media like did not capture um, all the like conversations between like people on the ground um, and like how do we actually get people motivated and moving um, and so for me like I my relationship with like the with social media was kind of like okay I'll, I'll check it every once in a while especially like you know when things are are kind of happening in the moment it's really helpful but it's actually not very help it's not very good at like building relationships that actually move people like to to do things um or at least that was my experience of it um and i know like in everybody has a different experience um but for for me personally and i know a number of my, like people that i was close with that were that were moving like it be kind of it became a toxic space like one a lot of arguments like happened that weren't like moving us forward and moving us towards change or anything um and it like just created a lot of like beef after beef after beef and it was like well what's the point of this um then the other thing that happened was that it became like just like mental health wise like you don't want to like have to like go and like be bombarded with this all the time at, at some point it's like i i know like black men and women and trans people and like everybody are like being murdered by the state right and but i don't have to, I, it's not good for me to like watch that over and over and over again um so like it became a space like i, I couldn't i i couldn't be on it if i wanted to actually keep doing the work because it was just like being a weight that was keeping me back right um and i think also um, my relationship to social media was kind of like uh like kind of two degrees of separation um where like I kind of more relied on people that were like that had big platforms like Kayla and like OBS um, to like get a lot of the news from that space, but without actually engaging it with it myself. And so like I would you know connect to people that um, I really trusted that were like in tune with that, and then I would like carry and they would convey the message to me, and then I would carry that message to like the 
to my my group of people, and then they they would carry it to like other people. And so I think there are definitely some people that you see on Twitter, but there are so many degrees of people that are like beyond that that are like kind of kind of tend to, kind of engaging with that message, but are really not reflected in it. Um, and so I think I was in that like kind of degrees of separation. So you all are in a room full of people who are really interested in. Um, documenting the now, right? To try to try, try to be able to capture what's happening, uh, particularly with social movements, as it's happening, right? And so um, one of the things that's really interesting is that this is a story that you all helped create, helped make into a global story. But at the same time, it's a story, and, and in many ways, attempted to control via Twitter, right? But at the same time, it's a story that's become so big that it's also beyond any of your control, right? And so one of the questions I really wanted to get at was, how do you all want the movement to be remembered? And what are some of the things that you would like people doing research around your lives, your work? Um, what are some of the things you want them to be conscious of? You can't stop them, right? But what are some of the things you would want them to keep in mind as they're doing that work? Um, can I go first? Yes. All right, cool. So um, to like really iffy about, um, I guess I'm more so just talking to like the black folks in the room. Um, when documenting the movement like internally, like don't, don't wash out like the internal politics of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like um, the argument, like don't, don't wash that stuff out. Don't wash away the homophobia. Don't wash away the sexism. Like, don't don't wash away the misogyny. Like don't wash away those frontline stories about what was happening to people like internally and how people felt unsafe. Like with people they were fighting next to. Like don't leave that out because we we have in all our movements and it leaves people so scorned and so hurt and so bitter. Which is why a lot of the arguments happen online. Which mm -hmm. is why like you know they don't really bother me because it it also humanizes our movement and I don't think we've got that with a lot of. With, I don't think we've gotten that with any black movement that we've had. They've never been humanized. They always felt they had to be perfect when fighting the system, and we just we just fucking aren't. Like <laughs> we just aren't. We're depressed. Um, we we like to drink and smoke to cope. Like we curse. Like we have kids. We have jobs. Like we're married. We're not. Like we're scorned. Like whatever. Like we're human. You know. And like I don't want people to forget that. Like I actually humanize the people out there these everyday people because they're literally like just like y'all in this room um, and like we can't we just can't wash them out of the story real quick I saw the uh, five minute uh, sign so yeah. we gotta wrap I'll it be quick. yeah so My bad. for me it's that, 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 that's really important and the other thing I would add to that um, the other thing I would add to that is just the idea of um, what Ruben was hinting to that social media at first was this super democratized space, but it somewhat perpetuates elitism. Mm. Um, that for those of us who have a plat, like I have uh, like 15,000 followers, Alexis is whatever, it changes. <laughs> um, but it's a lot. And so people some like mistakenly val put your value at how many people choose to follow you. Mm. And leadership isn't based on how many followers you have online. Leadership is based on how many people you're invested in and developing on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so some of my the most important things that I feel like I accomplished in the last two years maybe weren't told on social media, mm -hmm. right? Because um, they didn't need to be told on social media. And my development into self and our relationships, like that, those stories aren't told on social media. And so just being conscious of the fact that for every face that you see that has been lifted up, that we are standing on the shoulders of hundreds of giants that we'll never even see again. And Ferguson wasn't because the four of us just came together in a huddle and said, we go fight for black liberation. It's because thousands of people in St. Louis say, yo, this is messed up and I'm not gonna let this do it. I'm not gonna let this stand. And we see those people every time we go to Target, hopefully when you don't go to Walmart, um, <laughs> when you go into your local <laughs> fast food spot, you see those people who, for a moment, say, I'm going to give all of myself um, to a space and then go back to life. And so we've been epically um, blessed. Like, we've worked for it, but also part of it is just this crazy equation that happened that put us in the elevated space. And so our job in the elevated space is to always fight for those 
who are in those spaces and represent them well. And I think we really try to do that, but that's your job is to tell those stories, to find those people. And if you can't find those people, at least create space for that narrative to be, to be built that like, for the rest of my life, I owe people I'll never know. And mm -hmm. I, take that, I take that shit so seriously. You know, mm -hmm. like, in every space I represent, it's like my mom and my grandma are like behind some window I can't see. That's the way I need to behave because people literally sacrifice their lives and comfort um, for, for one person. And we, we have somewhat benefited from it, right? And somewhat been super traumatized by it. But in and, and, and the benefit has come more trauma. Um, but like accept that and like tell all of like tell our whole selves. And so I, I made this commitment in therapy because I didn't go to therapy before Ferguson. But I made this commitment that said like I will love. I commit to my community and myself to love us in our entirety. And that that that's the non-romantic stories. That's the we were hungry. We didn't have food. That's the subway lady giving us the sandwich when we ain't had no money. That's then her getting cancer and putting up a GoFundMe and reaching out to Ferguson activists who had become had platforms now to say y'all I have cancer when she would come out every single night and ask us, did we need to use the restroom again before the subway closed? That's a story that a lot of people don't know, but was so important to just how we sustain that that kind of community existed. Um, yeah, um, I, but they're hitting all the important points. Um, I, I, I imagine a lot of you guys are gonna be focusing on social media, but like, personally, like, like please don't, please don't just focus on social media. It's not the whole thing. It's like a fraction of it. Like, and if, you, if like whatever you're documenting only consists of like messages and narratives from social media, then it's, it's an inaccurate like documentation of what happened. Um, and so like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's I think the most important thing you can put out there. Be really critical um, because like a lot of us on the ground were critical and but like we didn't like engage and like we didn't put that put it all out there right um it was like written in group texts and it was you know um yeah all right that's enough for me <laughs> rushing i'll let you get your word in uh i kind of wish it was like documented right because there's so many so many like raw moments conversations at the rowan center right before we like we took over Steve Stinger's, you know, uh, celebration when, and just other moments that, you know, conversations I had with other activists that will never be able to be told that was so, uh, so important, that was so raw, um, so real from individuals that never knew each other, like I say, from a can of paint, uh, but managed to um, house someone just because they were out there standing, you know, next to you while you always getting shot by tear gas. They, they pretty much hit it, you know. If you if, tell the story, but you know, tell tell the, tell it all. I mean, just don't tell the good, but you know, tell the tell the rawness. I think what people don't really understand is, you know, August 9th, organizers didn't come to the streets, right? Um, organizations didn't come to the streets. Yeah. Everyday young African American men, women. Uh, all came to the streets that never probably organized before, never been in front of a tank and been shot with tear gas before, or with rubber bullets before, um, never harassed in a way that we was back on August 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, like we was before, right? So if you go tell it, I say just tell it all. Um, but the biggest piece, I think, is people don't understand that we are just everyday people like you guys are around, around the room, right? We didn't, not to throw any shade on the, on the past movement because it was previous movements that got us here, right? Uh, but we just didn't have those same skills that they had in the past. But we still managed to make so many um, great changes so far, and we're gonna continue to still make them through whatever line of work we're doing. All of us are fighting for Black Lives Matter up here, but all through different ways. Uh, and I think that's also the, the beautiful thing about it is it wasn't just folks that was out there just because police brutality. It was folks that was out there because they seen that economic injustice happened also. It was folks out there that seen that everyone that was out there wasn't being included like the LGBT community. And those individuals said, this is my role in the movement, and this is what I'm gonna go, and this is what I'm gonna run with. I don't have to be over here doing this. I could be doing my own thing, still liberating black people and liberating lives. So if you're gonna tell it, tell it all. Let folks know that 
the folks that was out there was not experienced organizers. So we did make plenty of mistakes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm sure moving forward, we'll make plenty more mistakes because when we make changes, the system always finds a way to pull them back. Um, and we have to find a way to be more creative and do different things to make people feel uncomfortable enough uh, to feel the anger and the pain that people have been going through for so long to actually make that change happen. So just tell it all and tell it all and be real, but be understanding that the young folks that went out there was not experiencing community organizing or experiencing organizing. It was folks that literally came from out the house of Canfield that just wanted to find justice in their community. It was folks that came from St. Louis City that seen what happened and was like, this isn't right. We need to do something about it. I don't know what I can do, but we got to do something about it. Yeah. I don't have any political clout. I don't have any big money, but I just want to make some change. Thank you all. Uh, I see the done sign flashing. So. Yeah, I mean, before we go into any questions, I just want to thank the panel. I mean, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, so um, there, oh, there are a couple. I was like, there are a couple of things. Um, but Rasheen, you know, is about to go into litigation around a race that we know he uh, unfairly lost mm -hmm. because we live in a situation, you know, where like elected officials figure out ways to cheat <laughs> and it's legitimate, and we don't say anything about it because black representation matters, but it's bad black representation. Um, so for me, you know, like I'm not with formal organization. I'm working on a STL Action Council, which I'm really, like, really happy about right now, because um, we're really trying to be very intentional about creating non-hierarchical collective leadership, and I'm trying to, like, we're, we're trying, see how I'm, like, I'm trying to make a we so that we could try to do that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, like, for me, it's just, uh, I mean, like, you want to just be honest, you know, I got textbooks I can't afford right now. <laughs> that I just, you know, like, but, um, so if you want to, you know, honor me with a book, sure, but, no, but it's like, that's what I, yeah, you know, I do, but, like, and more, more important, you know, like, oh, shit, the, yeah, I mean, you done? Like, no, you know, I, I got a list. <laughs> yeah, <I'm like>, <laughs> you hear me? Um, no, but, like, no, so, that's a, that's a real, like, the real, yeah. what I want to say is that that's a really difficult question because we have taught ourselves to be so humble that sometimes we don't ask for what we need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that was even a situation for me getting into, like getting here, being like, I'm just going to, you know, like I'm very nervous to show up and ask for things. And so like, um, like for me, that, like, that's a question that I like constantly work on. It's like, I'm so nervous to put my PayPal on Twitter. Like, yo, hey, I got, I'm so scared. Alexis is like, if you don't do that, that's not you. And I'm like, I can't, I, got you, I can't do it. Alexis is going to do it for me. but. Um, yeah, so th there's there's actual support and people still struggle with sustainability and th that's just not even us, right? Like that that we sit at tables sometimes and like eat the bill up for like our our friends who like look at us as people who have like made it, right? Mm -hmm. And like that tension, right? And like my dad's in the hospital and so like when I go out there, they're like I'm the stable one, right? Like I'm not I I wasn't telling you a story that I was the stable one then. So they didn't see me on CNN, so I'm super stable now. They're like, oh, yeah, you made it. You in somebody's book. You was just at Martha's Vineyard. Can you buy us lunch? And it's like 80 y'all. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> but you can't say no. And so um, 
It's just, it's just like living in that tension. So I appreciate that question because a lot of people don't think to ask it. They just that like our struggle, like our trauma, our stories aren't for your entertainment, right? That it, it is, I am here to share the story because I want the story to be told because I want the next generation to not have to do what we just did and go through learning lessons that people knew <laughs> and didn't want to articulate. And so I appreciate that question. Um, but yeah, there are many ways we can help. So, so one, a few of those ways. Um, nah, but really though, yeah. Um, so to, to step away from myself for a second, um, and kind of speak from my experience. So like therapy, um, sending people like direct folks on the ground, like asking direct people on the ground, like what's their PayPal? Um, so that folks without insurance or with insurance can go see a therapist that um, like that has a sliding scale so that they pay $80 every time, you know, so they don't have to have insurance. Like I think that is so important because there are so many people who want to go to therapy but just don't have access, but they were on the ground and it's so necessary. So like, um, just like reaching, like literally just getting on Twitter and reaching out to folks and be like, yo, what's your PayPal? And like, they'll send it to you. And you can just send, you could just send like 80 bucks and like, or however much, you know, for like mental health stuff. Um, other things is like self care things. Like I know for me is I love to go to the barbershop. Um, and sometimes, you know, I'll throw my cash me on Twitter and people send you like $10. So now you can go get your haircut and like, you know, like your anxiety is gone. Like you, <laughs> like you good, you know what I'm saying? Like. Um, um, well, it's not, it's not legal here, so that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, people take um, antidepressants and they don't have, they don't have access to healthcare, and so they can't afford their, they can't afford their Lexapro, um, or what, or like whatever would have you, or they can't even think about the possibility of getting that medication because they don't have the access. So little things like that, um, like with a focus on mental health when we're talking about emotional labor, um, like is like is definitely something to hold in on. Um, and we got a court case. Um, I'm actually expected to spend 60 days in jail. So if you would like to donate to my legal defense fund so I don't go to jail for 60 days, you can do that. <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> gonna tell you no. Right. Um, so yeah, and there's so many other people with cases. Like I can speak to myself, uh, speak for myself, and I can speak for my partner a little bit about our case, but there are other people with charges. Yeah, other um, people in jail, like Josh. There are people, Josh, yes, donating to Josh's commissary. Um, putting money in there. Um, Josh is the, I don't know if you all know Josh Williams, he was the young man who was locked up for eight years for attempting to start a fire in Ferguson. Um, so literally a, a, a political prisoner. Like, <laughs> and if you like, want access to know how to get to his commissary, like, I can find that for you. People can send that to you. Like, absolutely. There are so many like, little things that people need um, and monetary, monetary efforts like, are great. So. Um, I just say send people money to be like just upfront with it. Yeah. Uh, two things. So I think on a personal level, what would be helpful? Like Kayla said, I uh, did the right thing and got politically active as they tell us to go into politics. Yeah, you young folks um, in my neighborhood I ran against a political machine that's been in office 47 years. Um, and came really close, 55 votes, but living in the neighborhood, we know that absentee fraud is a real thing. Um, absentee fraud and going around registering people for absentee when they're not even registered voters or forcing seniors to do it, not knowing the absentee process is real. So you guys have all our Twitter follow handles. I was going to say follow this Twitter handles. Um, that court case probably will be coming up in the next month or two when I go and challenge it. So a little support maybe down at City Hall or the circuit attorney, uh, circuit court uh, building would be helpful. But uh, to flip the question back, I think also what would be good for everyone in the room is, uh, if you're not woke, I'm sure everyone in this room is woke. Uh, <laughs> wake the hell up, because there is injustice is going on everywhere. Uh, like I said, if it's not police brutality, there's some type of injustice that you can get plugged into. Um, play your role if it's in the workplace, if it's at school, if it's at home, and you hear that little racist joke that ain't that ain't funny and it, it don't need to be said, check check them um, and continue to like I say, let folks know about what the real movement is because there's a lot of people that say oh. Them black people just trying to go loot. Or they don't want no, no justice or this or that. But you guys can say, no, I done met four individuals who have been out for the last two years trying to make 
a difference not only in their community but in the in the our region not just our region but across the country so um, staying woke and then waking other people up and for my I'm sorry no shade intended and for my African Americans in the room because we like to sit on the couch a little longer and uh, some of our some of our generation is behind times we won't be able to speed them up but we uh, need to wake them up a little bit because they are still asleep. Um, and I think that was probably one of the, probably one of the biggest things is that our, the older generation was saying how we was doing it wrong or this wasn't right or there wasn't any leader and we just don't need that. Yeah. I, I, you can close up. Yeah, cool. I was just going to say one thing. So <laughs> he's, like, he's like, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, um, I was going to say, so you, know, you talked a, a couple of things about black people. So for my white people in the room, how y'all doing? Because mm -hmm. um, you ain't. Got to talk to y'all. Um, it's a couple of things. So like in this work, you do a thing where you tell people stories. And sometimes you take up a lot of space when you're telling someone's story. So be very conscious of making space for people to tell their own story. I made this tweet a couple months ago after the Orlando shooting, after I got off the phone with Alexis, because I was like in my feelings, because going through my own stuff. Um, about like what it actually means to be an ally. Um, and so I, I made that tweet and uh, I made it because I was like trying to tell myself that I was showing up wrong um, in my own like internal struggle over things. But what, what it says is that I made ally into an acronym and it's just like, you know, always listen to those who are the most impacted, right? And learn, like learn and listen to the marginalized, leverage your privilege. And so like, the most privileged person in America is the one that was born here that is white, that is male, that is cis and straight, and that is Christian. And so that person sits at the top of the kingdom of the food chain in our country, an able body. Um, and so every time that you get away from one of those things, those people need to be more centered than you. Um, and so I think that we, need, we have to do a, much, a, a really good job of saying, hey, yo, I'm, I'm taking up a lot of space, even if I'm telling someone's story. It's like, I'm trying to tell the story of Kayla Reed. It's like, Kayla Reed is alive and well. <laughs> like, Kayla can tell her own story. Make space for Kayla to tell her story. And so just be conscious of that. And then also just be conscious that even though this is your work, that you are still an ally of the work, right? Like, so it's, it's, not, your, it's not your story to tell just because you have the pen on the paper. You are, you are literally putting something in stone for the rest of time and do justice for all those people I was talking about earlier and honor them in a way that doesn't center whiteness in yourself but that centers them. And that sometimes that means decentering those of us who have platforms. But yeah, that's my thing. OK, I'm going to add two more things. Um, so one, a lot of you, I assume, are like on university campuses. Um, one of the things that like really pushed our student activism forward was looking back at student activism um, on, in WashU's history. So like, if you all have access to archives, connect to the students that are doing things. Like, they're really amazing like combinations of like things that can happen when you partner. Like, what's in our archives with what people with people that are trying to do things in the now. Um, the second is like we all got to start looking at class a lot more. <laughs> like that was like the thing that like I really kind of took away from like the Ferguson movement. Like I had this idea of like this is how we create change um, or like these are the problems and this is what we should do and like this movement has like really pointed out like that there's this huge gap in my own understanding and like widely like <laughs> Um, around like how class actually operates, um, especially like um, I think that's important for academics to interrogate um, as a, like because the university is like a very important pillar and like sustaining the class system um, as it is um, right now. So figure out what your relationship is to that <laughs> and um, like factor that into how you're archiving. So one of the things that we've been talking about with this project is affording agency um, and thinking about like, consent and ethics for the people who are on the front lines whose um, uh, lives have been lived out, you know what I mean, in, in this space. So um, I guess my question is about what are your um, hopes, desires,
desires, fears, concerns, um, apprehensions about like the archive, like this sort of long, like, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, which is kind of what this application and other um, uh, tools that are being developed are trying to think about. Because there's this potential for like, you know, relaying these stories to future generations, right? So they know about the poorness of this of this movement and its beauty and its and its and its uh, pain also. But like, could y'all just sort of talk to that like about um, uh, ways that that uh, the, the, again the, the hopes, fears, apprehensions, any of those things um, about this sort of like larger like violence of of the archive. Yeah. So. Yeah, so one of my fears is that I get framed into this one box. It's like, here's who she was December 1st, 2014, and it doesn't allow people to recognize how, how amazing and <coughs> necessary transformation is. And so a story from, from August to August to August, and I think each of us do this on August 9th, where we're like, we measure ourselves. Like, we have an internal survey of, like, how much have we grown, how much have we changed, how much have we contributed to. And I think who I was... Um, and like I think I've known Alexis the longest technically in this space and so Alexis saw me when I was timid, <laughs> um, quieter, um, really? shut up Jonathan. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> and so, so like that, that growth right and just the, the political analysis that comes with time, the, um, the maturity that comes with it, um, I think I, I, I am most scared that that, won't, that story can't be told because it's such a long and continuing story. But I, I want to figure out a way to archive and my, you know, like how do we encapsulate the fact that you can change and that you should want to change. And that, that is the most beautiful part of struggle is watching people change. Um, and so, but I'm hopeful with things, you know, like that we have more mediums like video and, you know, like we're, uh, Alexis and I are in this documentary, Who Streets, that's um, going to come out. That's done by Damon Davis and Sabah, and Damon's from St. Louis. And they were really intentional about just like following us into like nitty gritty stuff. You know, like I watched myself brushing my teeth, and I was like, I missed the left side. Why <laughs> like brush the side? Where the <laughs> but like the ability to. Um, that's how you brush your teeth. I just I like stay on this side a real lot. But like <laughs> the ability to watch myself change. You know, like, like physically change, and then also just like the way that I sound the way that I talk, the way that I make these connections. Um, I wonder other place, other people who drop in to have that one conversation with us, never, like they never come back and say like, okay, what's happening now, right? And so like how do we build something that is long enough to then show what happens to a person over a decade after a movement, that happens to a person after two years after a movement, that just isn't that one day, the next day after you guys hear cast, that is like after the trauma, after some healing has occurred, after more growth has been like done, how like how do we tell that well-rounded story? Because I think that story is how we make the movement continue to live. Because people see themselves at different points, but then they see the possibility. And movements will die when people don't dream of change, and so they have to see change to continue to dream of it. Um, so one of the things I'm afraid of um, is that, like, the narrative and the archive will be the same as like um, the one that people that were paying attention had of what was going on. Like, I know that's kind of like a convoluted sentence. Um, so like, as someone that was paying attention, um, like on the on media and social media, um, but then also active, I realized that there was a huge discrepancy between like the experience and what's being said. Um, and so I'm afraid like that whatever goes in the archive is gonna be like the narrative of like what was said rather than like what happened. Um, and so like if, if it matches like what everyone said was happening, then it's probably not right. <laughs> um, and so that's what kind of like when I think about what's going into the archive, that's the thing that kind of gets me nervous is I just hope it's not, not what I read because <laughs> that, that, that wasn't right. <laughs> um. You know, I would I would say um, don't forget to like talk about why people came to the movement, but also talk about what took them away. Um, there are some people who, who aren't in this shit anymore, and I'm one of them. Um, like I like I I gladly tell my story about why I quit and why what made me stop doing this work um, and how it's like 
constantly being traumatized because you can't really get out of it because you're just always in it because you're black and like you said he was there you know so you're just always in it but definitely like like telling like telling telling people stories about giving people the opportunity to talk about why they're not in this anymore um, because I look at all of the the activists the older activists the older black panthers like Elaine Brown for example is is a big example that I use and like she like like now that she's older, she really makes it a point to try and talk about what really happened because history has been so revised and romanticized that it forgets that like we sometimes we forget Elaine Brown ran the Black Panthers for how long? You know, we erased this black woman from this prominent organization in history. You know what I'm saying? And she like makes it a point to like make sure that her story is told. You know what I'm saying? But she shouldn't have to do that work by herself for as much work as she's done for us to be in like you know what I'm saying? So like make sure that like we do the we do the people that did this work that service if they need it, um, and making sure that like those emotions are are covered and like cared for, um, and documented, like from their from from their place and from their standpoint, if that makes sense. All right. Um, we probably should start documenting from here on out because, like Kayla said, the movement isn't over, right? Um, what happened? Two years ago on August 9th, um, it started in 2014, but the young people are still making change. Young people are still getting plugged in whatever way that they can. Outside of me, there was, what, five, six other Ferguson activists that all ran for office, right? That was after August 9th. So um, the fear is that, like Ruben and Kayla and Alexis said, that it it won't get told to the full potential that it should be and it's moments that I think the realest moments when no one was in the rooms, like I said earlier, where it was just conversations, scheming and dreaming, organizing arguments, right? And then turning from those arguments, uh, turning up with each other that folks just they they won't they won't see, right? And they won't it won't be able to be transcribed and it won't well something we don't want all of it probably down some of the turn ups. But <laughs> but it's some, it's some of those. It's just some of those real raw loving and caring moments. Not just when we was in the streets behind, but behind closed doors where people wasn't tweeting and newspaper wasn't writing up about Kayla or uh, Alexis or Ruben. Um, that won't be documented. That me personally is one of the most beautiful moments. I think out out of this movement, the moments that we wasn't able to see all the hard grunt work, all the argument, for everyone to see the finished, you know, the final product of the marches and all of the actions that we did, but it wasn't just as easy as putting that together as most people thought. Um, it was folks that didn't have relationships with each other, forced to have relationships and then backpedal, and it'd be like, oh, this is who you are, right? This is what uh, the real indiv individual that you really are. So the fear is that it won't be told to the fullest, but also that them, them real raw moments uh, that folks won't know about won't also be told. Yeah. So um, I want to be mindful of our panelists' time. We only asked them for an hour, and they've been gracious in giving us an extra 15 minutes. So thank you again uh, to Rasheen, Alexis, Ruben, Kayla, and Jonathan uh, for being here. Thank